All right, this is Deuteronomy 34 in the Prager Rational Bible, the last one. All right, Moses' death, verse 1. Moses went up from the steps of Moab to Mount Nebo to the summit of Pisgah, Pisgah opposite Jericho, and the Lord showed him all, the whole land, Gilead as far as Dan, too, all of Nephtali and, and the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, the whole land of Judah as far as the Western Sea, three, the Negev, and the plain, the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, as far as Zoar. So God showed Moses an expanse of land far more vast than any person would be able to see from a single vantage point. As he was about to die, Moses experienced a final miracle. Yep. All right, four. And the Lord said to him, This is the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will assign it to your offspring. So God's promise was made to Abraham in Genesis 12, 7, 15, 18, and to Isaac in Genesis 26, 3, and to Jacob in Genesis 28, 13. All right, few of us enter our promised land. I have I have let you see it us uh, I have let you see it with your own eyes, but you shall not cross there. So the image of Moses looking over the promised land that he would never enter into is emotionally gripping and and applicable to all of us. Few people, perhaps none, reach their promised land. And few people are going to reach the ultimate promised land. Because yeah, Jesus says, narrow is the gate, straight is the way that leads to life, and few are going to find it. Well, Moses found it. So, Anyway, the final chap this final chapter of the Torah. Yeah, this is the final chapter of the Torah, since Deuteronomy is the last of the five books of the Torah. So, But this final chapter of the Torah has always comforted me as it has taught me from an early age that no matter what success I might achieve, I will never fully realize my dreams. And this is not available to us mortals. Everything, yeah, Everyone leaves something unfinished. Yeah, Arthur uh, Penryn Dan, uh, Dean Stanley, uh, 1815-1881, was an Anglican Bible scholar and Dean of Westminster for 17 years, he eloquently expressed the human condition in this regard. Quote, To labor and not to see the end of our labor, to sow and not to reap, to be removed from this earthly scene before our work has been appreciated and when it'll be carried out on, yeah, when it'll be carried on, not by ourselves, but by others. It is is a law so common in the highest characters of history that none can be said to be altogether exempt from its operation. Yeah. So basically, just the people that do great things, they don't really see, I guess, to see like the end results of like all they accomplished, or they're not done, but someone else ends up continuing the work for them. Yeah, but Moses not entering the promised land was the imagery invoked by the American civil rights leader, the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Whether or not the Reverend King, at the age of 39, had any premonition of his impending death, he invoked the image. He invoked this image of Moses at the end of a speech he delivered the night before he was assassinated. He said this. Well, I don't know what will happen now, but we got some difficult days ahead, but it really doesn't matter with me now, because I have been to the mountaintop, and I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Yeah, longevity has its place, but I am not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will, and he has allowed me to go up to the mountain, and I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I am happy tonight. I am not worried about anything. I am not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. 
All right. Yeah. Well, sadly, what he hoped to accomplish was is becoming undone in this country. Yeah, where he wanted everyone to be treated equal. You know, not based on race, but by character. But sadly, that's being undone. Yeah. If Martin Luther King were still alive today, he would be absolutely appalled of what this country has become. So, yeah, it's a shame, you know. Yep. All right. Moses died alone, verse 5. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab at the command of the Lord. Now Moses did not die there because he was old and infirm, but at the command of the Lord. The Torah's language is understated. It does not provide any information concerning Moses' state of mind or the details of his death. We are told only that Moses died there. It is nevertheless impossible for the reader not to be moved. We have lived more of Moses' life than than that of any other figure in the whole Bible. Yeah. He is mentioned 770 times. Four of the Torah's four of the Torah's five books, Exodus, Moses, oh sorry, <laughs> Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy revolve around Moses. Well, ultimately they revolve around Jesus, who Moses talked about and prophesied. Yeah, Jesus says Moses spoke about him. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, but those books revolve around Moses, who is a shadow ultimately for Jesus. Yeah, but Moses, a man that we have been with from birth to death. And to me, and to many readers throughout history, this verse and the rest of the chapter could not have been written by Moses. It's possible that Moses wrote down the words that God dictated. I mean, maybe. But the more likely explanation is one opinion in the Talmud records that the last eight verses of the Torah, starting with this verse, were written by Joshua, Moses' successor. And that night, Moses, yeah, that Moses died alone is emotionally wretching. Most human beings want to die in the company of loved ones. Yes, Moses did die in the company of God, but is that enough? Does it compensate for no human company? We cannot know, as none of us experiences as none of us experiences God as directly as Moses did. However, in Genesis, God says about Adam, "It's not good for man to be alone." Though both Adam and Moses directly experience God, God's statement implies that even though God is God's statement implies that even God is not enough to fully. Yeah, assuage our loneliness. Yeah, well, maybe, well, even though we're not really alone with him, so, yeah, but I guess we would feel lonely without having a fellow human around us. Yeah, but, you know, yeah. All right, and a relationship with God is profoundly helpful for many people, indispensable to getting through life and death, but humans also need other humans. Yes, at the same time, God, knowledge of God and his love undoubtedly enabled Moses to die without the fear that many humans have. Yeah, death means passing on into oblivion or worse. Well, it is worse if you don't believe in Christ. Yeah, for a final thought regarding Moses' solitude in life as well as in death, I cite uh, Alexander McLaren, a Scottish Baptist scholar, uh, scholar from 1826 to 1910. He said this: Moses had endured to the full, uh, to the full, the loneliness, which is the penalty of greatness. Yeah, he endured to the full. The loneliness, which is the penalty of greatness. Okay. Six. He buried him in the valley in the land of Moab near Beth Peor. Who is the he who buried Moses? As there's no hint that anyone else was present in, in Moses' last moments. 
it would seem to refer to God. That God buried Moses himself may be the most touching description of God in the Bible. It's an image that remains with students of the Torah throughout their lives. And no one knows his burial place to this day. And that no one knows where Moses is buried is further evidence that no person or persons buried him. It is unlikely that if someone buried Moses, the location would have never been divulged. Yeah, yeah. People rarely keep such secrets to their uh, to the grave. Yeah. And on this matter, Princeton philosopher Walter Kaufman offered these thoughts here. Quote, Moses went away to die alone, lest any man should know his, know his grave to worship there or attach any value to, uh, value to his mortal body. Having seen Egypt, he knew how prone men are to such superstitions. Going off to die alone, he might have left his people with the image of a mystery, with the idea of some spiritual transfiguration, with the thought that he did not die but went up to heaven. Well, he did go up to heaven ultimately with the notion that he was immortal and divine. Instead, he created an endearing image of humanity. He left his people without the thought that, being human and imperfect, he was not allowed to enter into the promised land, but that he went up on the mountain to see it before he died. Yeah, but he went into the present promised land and then ultimately the eternal promised land. Yeah. Yep, even though he missed out on the earthly one. Yeah. Ever since, what the Jews have presented to the world has not been Moses or any individual, but their ideas about God and man. It is a measure of Moses' greatness that one cannot but imagine that he would have approved wholeheartedly. It would have broken Moses' heart if he had thought that his followers would build temples to him and make images of him or even elevate him into heaven. That has never been def that he has never been deified is one of the most significant facts about the ideas of God and man in the Old Testament. All right, verse seven. Moses was a hundred twenty years old when he died. His eyes were undimmed and his vigor, yeah, unabated. Moses did not die of old age. He was alert and vigorous in his final moments. He died because God caused him to die. While people understandably consider a long life a great blessing, yeah, Moses was granted an even greater blessing. Long life with continued vigor of both body and of mind. Yep, and his soul with Jesus. All right, people in positions of authority should not seek to be loved. Verse 8, And the Israelites bewailed Moses in the steppes of Moab for thirty days, and the period of wailing and mourning for Moses came to an end. Now given the care and precision the Torah uses in its choice of words, it may be worth noting that there is a slight difference between the description of the Israelites mourning Aaron's death in Numbers 20:29 20, and their mourning Moses's. And the text here states, And the Israelites bewailed Moses thirty days. Whereas in Aaron's case, yeah, the Torah writes, All of the house of Israel bewailed Aaron for thirty days. Now, whether or not there is any significance to this difference, the word all is omitted in describing the Israelites' mourning of Moses. And the Israelites may have loved Aaron more than Moses. Now, while Moses was the great leader, he was also much tougher and more demanding than his older brother. And compare, for example, their reactions to the golden calf. Aaron gave in to the people's desire to build the calf, whereas Moses smashed the Ten Commandments when he saw what was happening. He ground that idol to dust and he forced the Israelites to drink it, and then he had thousands of idolaters killed. But being loved is not the most important trait in a leader. Indeed, every great leader is not loved by many. The great Abraham Lincoln was widely hated and was killed by one of those 
Americans who did hate him. Yeah, John Wilkes Booth. To cite one other example, the moment that World War II ended, the British people's love for Winston Churchill diminished even though for them, yeah, even enough for them to throw their great wartime prime minister out of office. Yeah, that's a shame. Because, yeah, he is one of the greats. He may, he may actually be the greatest prime minister of all time in Britain. Probably him and Margaret Thatcher. Probably those would be like the top two. Maybe. Alright, and we should be aware of the leaders who seek to be loved. Yeah, stay away from such people because their priority, yeah, and their primary concern, their top priority is not the love, uh, sorry, is not the people that they're supposed to lead. Their primary concern is themselves. Yes. And this holds true holds true for every position of leadership. Parents, clergy, teachers, police, and military officers. As a general rule, people should only seek to be loved by their spouses and friends. And this is even true of parents. Parents whose primary goal it is to have their children of pre-adult age to love them well, yeah, to love them will probably fail as parents. Yeah, if, if, you're primary, if you're primarily concerned with trying to get your kids to love you, then yeah, you're not going to do a good job with the parents So as parents. Sorry. Yeah, you do your job well. Your kids are not always going to like you. But they may end up respecting you later on if you actually do your job well. Yeah, parents should seek to be respected more than loved. And this is better for them and it's far better for their children. While children need both parental love and parental authority, they need the latter more. Now that parental authority should come out of love ultimately yeah yeah you shouldn't get you don't don't get out of bounds with the parental authority so you gotta be careful with that so yeah so balance you know set up boundaries but don't let them do whatever they want so all right, parental authority gives children what they need, what they want and need most, security. Yeah. And one might say that any that parental authority is parental love. Yeah, I mean God, yeah, I mean if you discipline your child when they do wrong, I mean it may not seem like it, but that's actually loving your child. And when God disciplines his children, that's actually a sign that he loves his children. Yeah, the father disciplines those he loves. So, even if we don't always like that, but it is a part of love, you know, being corrected or disciplined when you do wrong. So, that way you learn to not do it again. Yeah. Or hopefully you don't do it again. Yeah, well, sometimes you do anyway. Yeah, because we just sin, sin, sin. But anyway. Alright, 9. Now Joshua the son of Nun was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands upon him and the Israelites heeded him, doing as the Lord commanded Moses. Again, as the rest of the Bible emphasize, Again, the Torah, as the rest of the Bible emphasizes wisdom as the most important trait in a leader. Well, I would say ultimately that and courage. Yep, yeah, indeed, there is no important. There's no more important trait in any person than wisdom, and without wisdom, good intentions and even kindness and courage are ultimately of little use. In fact, good intentions without wisdom often lead, often than not, lead to evil. Yep, yeah, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. That's very, very true. Yeah, that's an old and well-known adage for a good reason. And so is intelligence without wisdom. It's useless. Yeah, intelligence and wisdom are not the same thing. Because you can be smart and also be a fool. Yeah, yeah, you can be smart and be a fool. Yeah, well, you're a fool if you don't know God. Yeah, 
yeah, ultimately, yeah, anyone. Yeah, and you don't walk in God's ways, then you're being foolish as well. Yeah, so, yeah, because that's what it means to be wise. It's to walk in God's commandments. That's the true wisdom. All right, and then Joshua is almost always identified as the son of Nun, perhaps as a way of emphasizing that Moses did not choose a blood relative as his successor. He assigned the job to somebody that he knew would get it done. Yep, and he did. You know, Joshua was also a great leader who did obey God and you know did what God wanted. He, yep, he, under yeah with God and the leadership of Joshua. Yeah, well, God was using Joshua to lead. Yep, they did get the promised land, but sadly they didn't drive everybody out though. And that has its consequences and judges. All right, essay. The greatness of Moses. Verse 10. Never again did there arise in Israel a prophet like Moses, whom the Lord singled out face to face. Now, no mortal can literally encounter God face to face, because if he did that, he would die. Yeah, but Moses was spoken to by God more directly than any other person. And Moses possessed several characteristics that enabled him to be the great leader and man that he became. One, having been raised an Egyptian in Pharaoh's palace, no less, Moses was steeped in another culture. And throughout history, some of the most influential national leaders from good to evil, they were born in another nation. Napoleon was, uh, yeah, Kors yeah, Korshikan, however you say that, Korshikan, I guess, it, I don't know if, if that's how you say it, not French. Yeah, Muhammad Ali, the father of modern Egypt, he was Macedonian, he was Macedonian, he was not Egyptian. And the dictator, the communist dictator, Joseph Stalin, was... Yeah, Georgian, he was not Russian. And Hitler was Austrian, he was not German. And Moses was raised an Egyptian, not an Israelite, even though he actually was one. But unlike the others on this list, his impact was entirely moral and of eternal significance. Two, Moses loathed injustice and he always confronted it regardless of whether the victim was a Hebrew or a non-Hebrew, a man or a woman. Yeah, and you saw that Egyptian oppressing that Hebrew when he killed that Egyptian. All right, three. Yep, when confronting injustice, Moses knew instinctively what to do, when to stand up, when to speak up, and if necessary, when to kill. Four. Moses had no desire to be a leader or for glory. After fleeing Egypt, he would have been content to remain a shepherd and a family man in Midian. He turned God down five times whenever God asked him to assume leadership of the Hebrews in Exodus 3 through 4, 17. 5. Moses began as a humble man and became ever more so over the years as he interacted with God. Yeah, I mean, if you end up growing and interacting with God more, then, yeah, of course you're going to become more humble. And one might think that having a uniquely intimate relationship with the creator of the universe would make one feel, yeah, would lead one to feel superior to all mortals. Well, if you really do have a relationship with the creator, you're not going to feel that way. He may end up having that same attitude as the Apostle Paul when he says, you know, Christ saved me, the chief of sinners. Yep, but Moses didn't feel superior. Indeed, the Torah describes Moses as the most humble of all men in Numbers 12, 3. And this makes sense and it teaches an important lesson. The better one knows and or experiences God, the less arrogant that person will be. Yes, 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 yes. Which raises important questions. If you meet an arrogant religious person, does this person really believe in God 
that is the God of the Bible. Well, they may claim to, but if they are pretty arrogant and self-righteous, I would say no, they don't know God, even if they claim to believe in Him. And they're not really a Christian, because humility is the mark of a true Christian. And does this person believe in himself more than God? Good point. Six, Moses did not hold on to resentments. After his siblings Miriam and Aaron spoke against him, and in response God struck Miriam, uh, Miriam with the skin disease, yet Moses interceded with God on her behalf in Numbers 12. And most impressive of all, Moses kept forgiving his people who constantly complained against him. Seven, Moses gave up power graciously. God told Moses to lay one hand upon Joshua and thereby transmit leadership to him. Numbers 27, 18. But Moses at a public ceremony laid both hands upon him. Numbers 27, 22 through 23. In 1878, the eminent economic philosopher Henry George delivered a lecture on Moses in which he summed up Moses' achievements. He said this, quote, to lead into freedom a people long crushed by tyranny, to discipline and order such a mighty host, to harden them into fighting men before whom warlike, tri warlike tribes quailed and walled cities went down, to repress discontent and jealousy and mutiny, they required, it required some towering character, a character blending in the highest expiration the qualities of a politician patriot philosopher and statesman yep moses i guess you could say had such qualities 11 yeah for various signs and portents that the lord sent him to display in the land of egypt against pharaoh and all of his quarters uh, quarters and his whole country and 12 for all the great might and awesome power that Moses displayed before all Israel. Yep, Deuteronomy concludes with the theme that is frequent, uh, frequently stressed. Israel saw these wonders firsthand. You see Deuteronomy 4.34 and 6.22 and 29.1-2. through 2. The Israelites do not have to rely on second-hand reports. And they witness the event. They witness the events and are certain of the truth that they prove the indisputable authenticity of Moses. Tige said that. And the Torah begins with God's creation of the world, and it ends with before all Israel. And the Torah's first word in the beginning, yeah, Borishite, however you say that, and the last word is, and its last word is Israel. So it's fair to say that no two events have shaped human history as have God's creation of the world and God's creation of the Jews. And there you go. That'll do it. That is the end of the Deuteronomy Rational Bible and the end of the Deuteronomy series. Well, that was awesome, but that's not the end of doing the videos. There's going to be more... To more to come lord willing so stay tuned because i think i'm going to be doing the gospel of mark next so i'll be going back to the new testament and maybe one of these days in the future lord willing i'll go through another one of the rational bibles maybe go through genesis or exodus again and hopefully the numbers one will come out at some point Maybe next year. I don't know. Alright. Well, it was awesome to read about that book. Deuteronomy. Yeah, hopefully more people can read that. The other scriptures. And I just hope that, you know, we can take what we learned here and apply it to our lives. And, uh, and hopefully we can become more like the very one that Moses wrote about. Yeah, Jesus. All right, well, until the next video series or parody, may God bless you in the grace and mercy won by Jesus Christ and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit.
be with you all.